Welcome back to week six of our class. In this lecture, we're going to cover the American pioneers of psychology. They were active in the 1800s and 1900s. Psychology in the United States evolved much like it did in Europe. We will learn about some of the things that happened in the United States in this time period. Let's start with the zeitgeist of American psychology in the 1800s. Recall that the word zeitgeist refers to the spirit of the times, the climate of the times. In the early 1800s in the United States, psychology was mostly philosophical. No experiments were being conducted. Then in the mid 1800s, higher education expanded in our country and so did American psychology. In the late 1800s, psychology mirrored Europe's psychology, which was more scientific than it had ever been before. This is thanks to Wilhelm Wundt, the founder of psychology, and to Charles Darwin, the promoter of evolutionary thinking. In the 1800s, psychology was dominated by philosophy, religion, and what we call faculty psychology. At the time, there were only a handful of universities in the United States. Harvard University was established in 1636, the University of Pennsylvania in 1740. Many of the professors at the time were also Protestant ministers. If you were a student in the 1840s and you were interested in studying psychology, the first class that you would take was called mental philosophy. It was the equivalent of today's general psychology classes. Psychology was not scientific. It was not experimental just yet. No research labs were available for professors or their students, and no academic journals had been established yet. Faculty psychology was created by Scottish philosophers. They believed that the mind was made up of various parts, and they called these parts faculties. These parts interact to produce our behavior, so they were on to something. Intellectual faculties included things like memory, reasoning, judgment. Active faculties included free will and emotions. They said that any theory of the mind should investigate both types of these faculties, intellectual and active. You can see that these faculties match some of the major topics that we study in psychology today. Later in 1858, Thomas Upham published American Psychology's first textbook, Elements of Mental Philosophy. You see that phrase again, mental philosophy. That is how psychology was defined in the early 1800s. By observing behavior, some philosophers tried to identify the principles that explain these faculties. Again, experiments were not yet being conducted. At most, those interested in psychology observed others and then simply speculated about the processes that might be at play. They said the mind is like a muscle. We've heard it compared to computers, to machines. Now we have a group comparing the mind to a muscle. Mental health, according to them, means strengthening the intellectual faculties, things like reasoning, so you can overpower the active faculties, like emotion. An example of this might be emotional intelligence. Following socially acceptable expressions of behavior requires intellectual faculties. It requires us to use that part of our mind to overcome our instinctual, our impulsive reactions to certain situations. At the time, of course, we didn't have the term emotional intelligence. It's just an example of how the mind is like a muscle. Moving on to the mid 1800s. At this time, higher education was undergoing drastic changes and these changes influenced how the field of psychology developed. Immigration brought new ways of thinking and new ways of doing. As highly educated, highly skilled individuals like doctors 
teachers, entrepreneurs, traveled to the United States in large numbers. As the population increased, the number of high schools increased, which meant the number of colleges needed to increase, the need for college instructors then increased, and as a result of all of these different things, we can say that the demand for higher education increased substantially in the mid-1800s. To address the increased demand for higher education, the federal government put a new program into place. In 1862, they established the Morrill Land Grant Act, which gave every state 30,000 acres on which to build higher education institutions. They had to use the land for that purpose. In 1819, we had 49 colleges. In 1859, we had 289 colleges. 1899, we had 721 colleges. And then by 1934, we had nearly 1,000 universities in the United States. The red dots on this map identify which universities were established by this land grant. Then in the mid to late 1800s, colleges for women and African Americans were established because at the time, many of the existing universities prohibited minorities from attending, sometimes from even setting foot on campus. By the early 1900s, there were nearly 120 women's colleges in the United States. Vassar College was established in 1861 and Smith College in 1871. By the 1940s, there were nearly 100 universities that had been created specifically for African American students. Examples include Howard University. It was established in 1867. Harris Stowe State University, which is in downtown St. Louis, it was established in 1857. In the late 1800s, universities began to emphasize research and the creation of new ideas instead of replicating old studies and repackaging those ideas as new ideas. They did this by recruiting the best students from across the globe and they would offer these students fellowships, which often included tuition waivers and monthly stipends in exchange for those students working for the university. We still do this today. Many master's degree and PhD students in psychology pay for their education by working for the university while they're going to school. The university provides a job opportunity either in a research lab or working for a professor in the classroom as a teaching assistant. And in exchange, the students don't have to pay tuition and get a little extra money every month to live on. As a result, religion and science began to separate. Professors were no longer acting as priests, and many of the professors supported Darwin's idea of evolution. In the last 20 years or so of the 1800s, American psychology began to reflect the new psychology. It looked more like Europe's psychology. It was more scientific, it relied on Wundt's introspection, and it incorporated different types of evolutionary thinking. This dominance would only last up until World War I, however, when behaviorism took over and became the dominant force in psychology.